born in 1950 and grew up during the Civil Rights Movement in Portsmouth, Ohio, a stop on the Underground Railroad. But Chuck Ely never wanted to be a professional athlete. He never had that ambition. Instead, he dreamt of going to university and getting a degree. He wouldn't settle for colleges that offered him third-string quarterback positions. He accepted a scholarship with the University of Toledo to be the first-string quarterback. Chuck Ely led the Toledo Rockets to 35 consecutive wins, an NCAA football record that still remains unbeaten today. Despite that, he was passed over in the 1972 NFL Draft. He could have played in the NFL as a running back or defensive back, but he refused to acquiesce and play a position less worthy than what he deserved. Chuck never planned to come to Canada. It wasn't on his radar when the Hamilton Tiger Cats signed him in 1972. He led Hamilton to the Grey Cup his first season. Find out why Chuck Ely was passed over in the NFL draft, find out what ended his career, and find out why he stayed in the region appeal. Join me, Tina Pandia, as I talk one-on-one -on -one with Chuck Ely right after this break. Welcome back to One on One. I'm your host, Bina Pandia, and joining me, I have Chuck Ely. Chuck, welcome to One on One. Well, thank you, Bina. Well, Chuck, you're a famed football player. There's no doubt about that. <laughs> I don't know about being a famed football player, but a uh, long time ago I played. <laughs> well, you've got a great cup to, you know, yep. uh, stand by, so you're obviously uh, quite uh, the athlete. But tell me, where did you grow up? I grew up in southern Ohio, a little place down in, uh, it's called Portsmouth, Ohio. It's down mm -hmm. on the Ohio River just about a hundred miles east of Cincinnati and uh, south of Columbus, Ohio. So just right across the river was Kentucky, so pretty close to the south. Yeah, down south there. So did you have sort of a privileged upbringing or what's, what sort of a childhood uh, youth life did you have? Well, it's very interesting. I think, uh, you know, because you did play professional football, people kind of expect that you just sort of walked into this world and was like it was. Uh, but my upbringing was very difficult. I lived in the projects, uh, very low income housing. Mm -hmm. uh, mother and the father divorced when I was small. And so most of my life was just sort of struggling through just the basic needs of having enough food to, to get by the day. But uh, I was distracted with sports and enjoying the lifestyle of, of, of being in, in a city where your parents loved you, people took care of you. But it was a very difficult upbringing. Okay, now you say you were distracted um, by sports. What kept you sort of on the right track when it's so easy in that sort of environment to go the wrong way? Well, I, I don't think you know any different when you're in that environment. And I think because of the community involvement, because this was right during the period of time of the, the civil rights movement, it was a very difficult time in American history. Right. And uh, the community that we lived in, and it was, you know, people call it a ghetto, but mm -hmm. it was just a black section of town that we lived in. And everybody made a very special effort to take care of each other. And sports became a great outlet for me as far as what I could do not to be frustrated and go and doing something wrong. Now, how influential was your mom in your upbringing? Because you say that, you mm -hmm. know, basically uh, your parents were divorced. Was your father really in the picture or not, or was it your mother just raising you? Uh, I don't ever remember living with my dad. My, okay. my dad lived in the same town, uh -huh. uh, but was, had very little involvement with my life as far as other than just being my father. Uh, my mother took care of everything, uh, whatever she needed to do, and she was very limited because she had only an eighth grade education. Mm -hmm. uh, she could only get a certain types of jobs. Uh, and there were times in, that were very difficult uh, for food and clothing and other things that a lot of people take for granted uh, nowadays, even my kids, if I yeah. have to say that. But uh, it was very tough. But at the same time, there was a great deal of love that she, she poured out on me in the, in, within the community. So it made a lot of difference in how you looked at life as it was. Well, you talk about your community and how much support they offered you. In what sort of way did the community offer you support? Well, you know, th there's a thing that, that you have here called block parents. Where right. They, protect you yes. well that was an automatic thing there uh, all the people that lived in the community the projects they looked after each other's child because sometimes if you went outside that community mm -hmm. some difficult things could happen to you so uh, they, they were kind of protective and if, if you were not disciplined they could spank you <laughs> and then send okay. you home to your mother to that she would spank you again but I mean it was that kind of caring that, that, that I would say that she had because uh, their whole uh, objective was to make sure that that protection was there in a number of different wor ways. Who's sort of responsible for guiding you into the sports world? Obviously, uh, you know, you're a young child growing up. Mm -hmm. Well, there was nobody in particular. I think it was just the nature of the environment because 
we became brothers and sisters and, and playing and enjoying everything. It mm -hmm. was a very natural transition to move from football to basketball to baseball to track. Uh, and then the, the mentors within that community were some of the players that, you know, play professional ball now, like Larry, no, they don't play now, but they were two or three years older than me, Larry Heisel, Al Oliver. Uh, so we never looked at being a professional athlete. What we looked mm -hmm. at is being like the other guy, in this case, that were three years older than me and or okay. something that would that so somebody to look up to yes somebody sort of follow in their footpath yes I mean, it was it was kind of a mentorship it, it really didn't matter what sport it was right. uh, one of the things that was driving me was that I wanted to get further education so in the states they give you a scholarship if you could play football basketball baseball very well right. and I was able to get a scholarship and that was a, my driving point but uh, never looking at the avenue of playing professional sport but why football? You said there was basketball, there was baseball. Why, why football? No particular reason. I, I, I probably enjoyed playing basketball a lot more than I did playing football. It just so happened that uh, the way the things and the timing worked out, I was excelling very much with my team mm -hmm. as a state champions in football and was able to get a scholarship offer uh, at the University of Toledo. How did you balance sort of your academic success in high school with also giving up uh, time practicing? Well, I don't think you practicing was a sort of giving up time. Practicing okay. for me, because I was a only child, was the enjoyable part about it. Uh, it so, uh, going after school after school and going to practice was just sort of a natural fulfillment of what I enjoyed doing. Uh, the academic side of it, I enjoyed too, because I knew that there was an end process to that. But uh, it was almost like one big day going from school to practice to study to back to the next day. So it was all uh, um, a good process for me that I, it didn't seem like a, a problem. When did it sort of click in or have a light bulb moment that, you know what, sports is going to carry you further than high school? I, I think that the, the, the first time when we start winning the championship, I was undefeated in high school football. So, and as a quarterback, uh, it meant that there were a number of universities were sending you letters and sending you information that they would like for you to come to their university. And, and they started clicking in because that was my motivation. Uh, again, it was not to sort of play professional, but right. was to go to university. So it clicked in probably my uh, grade 12 year that I was going to have this opportunity to play somewhere and, and, and get a chance to further my education, that, which was very critical to me. We'll be back right after the break to follow Chuck Ely's successful football career. Welcome back to One on One with Chuck Ely. Chuck, you managed to get through high school. Mm -hmm. You're on to college now. Mm -hmm. So what happened in college with your football career? Well, it <laughs> was uh, quite amazing because it sort of carried on the same tradition that I had in high school and that we were undefeated in, in high school. And right. uh, I, I got an opportunity to play quarterback at the University of Toledo. And uh, if I sort of zipped fast forward, uh, after three seasons of playing on the varsity, we won 35 straight games, which is a uh, NCAA record at this date that's still going that nobody's been able to do that as a quarterback since uh, I played. Well, why did you pick the University of Toledo? Because you did have other offers. Yes. I, I picked the University of Toledo because it, it it was strange that I had an opportunity to go to a couple of other universities, but uh, they wanted me as a defensive back and as a quarterback, and, and there was a good reasons why, why they wanted to do what they wanted to do, but I wanted to play quarterback. And when I went to the University of Toledo, the coach said, we would like for you to come here as a quarterback. Uh, so the, the decision for allowing me to play what I wanted to play right. was very important for me to make that decision. Well, you had amazing success in your sort of college football career. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think you were number eight in the Heisman Trophy. Yeah, I was uh, fortunately uh, in my senior year, I was number eighth in the Heisman Trophy. I had been the most valuable player in the Mid-American Conference, which was a number of teams within right. that conference that uh, they'd be player of the year for those years. So we won three Tangerine Bowls down in Florida. So I had a, a, a really successful collegiate career as most by most standards. Okay, with that amazing success though, why didn't you go into the uh, NFL? I mean, uh, I'm, well, hey, I mean, come on, like if you're at the top of the game, <laughs> if you're so good. Yeah, well, so. uh, there's a documentary that we're doing, working on in, in the States about that because now people look back at the history. Again, I pointed out earlier that during the period of American history, there were some social, racial kind of things that were mm -hmm. going on. And some people would say uh, it was because they didn't, they didn't have any black quarterbacks in mm -hmm. the NFL at that time. Again, I got drafted. I mean, I didn't get drafted, but I got an opportunity to go into the NFL, but they wanted me to play defensive back. And I told them I didn't want to play defensive back. 
And uh, my whole dream was about getting a, a degree, so I was able to get my degree. But also, uh, I got an offer to come to Canada uh, to play in the CFL and to play the position that I love and played as quarterback. But as a young athlete mm -hmm. who's struggled, who's become successful, has done everything by the textbook, okay? Right. You completed your degree, you had academic success along with right. you know, your sports success. How did you feel as a person being denied a position that you should have been offered? Well, or, or that you were qualified yeah. for? Okay, well, no, okay. And, and I was disappointed. I think that the, the, the one thing about it, growing up in that environment, you understand and you see enough things that the expectation potentially is going to happen that that you weren't going to get drafted just right. because of the nature of, of the environment that we were living in. Uh, so I wasn't uh, sort of not knowing that this is a possibility, mm -hmm. but I was disappointed because it was me. Uh, but I, I wasn't about to sacrifice what I believed in myself to take something less than what I wanted to do. So I, I knew I could do other things. When you ended up in Canada, where did you end up? I came to Hamilton mm -hmm. at first. I was uh, I didn't realize much about the Canadian Football League when I right. first came to Canada, uh, and th then I got this information. The guy came down and to talk to me and said, you know, we we have you on a negotiation list with Hamilton. We like for you to come up here to see your c city, et, et cetera, et cetera. So it started on an easy uh, road trip as far as what we could do, and uh, I came up and saw the city and. So it was no different than where I was living, <laughs> but uh, which was okay, and, um, and then started my career here in Hamilton in 1972. Well, you were Rookie of the Year first year. Yes. You won your Grey Cup. Yes. You have your ring on. Yes. And you're very proud of it. Right. Um, how did you feel? Well, you, you feel good. I mean, it, it was kind of like, we well, remember, I, I won 18 straight games in high school. Right. I won 35 straight in, 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 in university. And then we won the Grey Cup. So it was kind of like one of those things, oh, this is expected. <laughs> you know, that's the kind of idea. So but I guess you never heard the word failure? Well, you know, well, I, you know, we've heard the word failure. I mean, I didn't win all my basketball games and mm -hmm. things like that. But at the same time, uh, I, I found it was a uh, very kind of a natural thing until you find out a couple of years later that you didn't <laughs> win it. But uh, it was uh, just a natural progression of what I felt I wanted to do and what happened to me. Okay. Well, after the break, we're going to continue on with Chucky e. Lee. Welcome back to One on One with the fascinating Chuck Ely. Chuck, you had a great career, but you also faced a sports injury that ended your career. What happened? Well, it was it was kind of like the final thing that happened. The I, final I, hurrah? I, yeah, because I, I had planned that I wanted to play five to seven years, and then I wanted to live my life. I, right. I don't think like most people think about professional athletes. Not all of us want to play pros until we die. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I knew there was a direction I wanted to go right. into. And it would just so happen that final year that I was looking at my retirement and stepping away from the game that I did have this final injury that for the first time in my life I had mm -hmm. missed three or four games. Right. And I think that was kind of culminating the, the, the thing that I wanted to do. And so after that point I decided to retire and, and just do what normal people do. You know, sort of live their life and uh, like people want to be a pro or whatever. Right. But for us, we sometimes just want to go fishing or go to the cottage or whatever it would be. And sometimes you couldn't do that plan. Uh, professional football because you're always training. Right, and you worked for, uh, like you played for various teams mm -hmm. across Canada. Yeah, I played, started off in Hamilton in 72 mm -hmm. and 74 was traded to Winnipeg. I was out of Winnipeg and, and as much as I like the Western people, I, I needed to come back east to be closer to my, my hometown okay. and back in Ohio mm -hmm. to get back and forth for a family that was right. in the state. So uh, I was very happy to come back to the Argonauts and play in, in my career there. So you uh, had a great career. Did you make lots of money? <laughs> make lots of money. Uh, well, no. <laughs> I mean, you're, I had an opportunity. I mean, here. Well, I mean, I think most people think that uh, that uh, the professional athlete uh, can make because they're professional, right. they make a lot of money. Well, they don't make a lot of money. In some sports, they do, but mm -hmm. at that time in the CFL, we didn't make that much in the sense that I had a good living right. uh, because it was half of a year uh, of what a income I was making. But at the same time, uh, I still worked as a supply teacher in the off season. Uh, one because I wanted to work, and mm -hmm. two because it did provide some other revenue. So there was no major endorsements. There was no oh. sort of night commercials. There was no. No, no, not at that time. And and uh, in the Canadian Football League, it's not the same thing as people see on television in the right. NFL or with the big pro sports and stuff like that. 
Um, you said that uh, getting an education was very important to you. Absolutely. What did you study in college? I studied economics. Now, when mm -hmm. you say that, that sounds all uh, yeah, nice. Yeah, it was, fancy. I was the economics of transportation. I was dealing things with truck workloads and, and things like that. So right. my basic degree was in, in business transportation in, in, the, in the commerce division. And how do you think that prepared you for supply teaching and everything else you didn't like? Well, I used that as a, as a backdrop to do some of the supply teaching in the off season and into some of the business courses within the thing, even the thing from shorthand. I don't know anything about shorthand, but I ended up yeah. teaching some of it. But uh, I, I think it was setting me up to be able to do some of the things I'm doing now, dealing with business, doing it with the financial planning, doing some of the things that basically understanding the, the dollars and cents and helping people make right decisions in regards to their career as well as their personal life. When you were supply teaching, uh, was there a certain grade or a certain subject that you were supply teaching? Well, you, you were doing everything from, like I said, shorthand to economics to typing right. uh, to everything that would come up in that, that, that department of uh, business within the school. So uh, I used to go around, and, and I remember one time I was teaching Wayne Gretzky at one of the schools oh. I was teaching in, in that uh, I didn't know who he was at the <laughs> time, but obviously uh, he was in a business course at, at one of the schools that I was teaching in. Right. And, uh, but I, I, it was a variety of different areas of business that you taught in. How did um, the Canadian public react to you when you came here? Like, are you, were you happy with them? Oh yes. Uh, did very, they support very much you? So. Very, very much so. I, I think that when I came to Canada, the the whole social environment is was at that time especially was so different than that in the U.S. Mm -hmm. in, in in how they responded to people of color, the reactions, even the fact to be a quarterback. Uh, you know, that's something you don't talk about a lot. But that was a big jump. That was a right. big step. And uh, that was uh, the opportunity that I needed to make sure that I could do what I wanted to do. Why did you come back to this area particularly? You could have gone, you know, anywhere sort of in, in Canada. Well, I, I, I liked the area because it was closer. I mean, I'm four hours from Ohio as far as a drive is concerned. Right. I can get back to the States uh, to do the things you want. And I became a Canadian citizen because of, of coming here, living right. here, and being a part of the environment. And uh, I, I love this area because it, it sort of suits the lifestyle that I want to live and within the general public. We'll be back right after the break with Chuck E. Welcome back to One on One with Chuck E. Lee. Chuck, in addition to uh, all your sort of sports success, you've also become a motivational speaker? Well, you know, I, the color motivational, as I said to you before, I think it's more inspirational. I think that the, the thing that happened coming from the backdrop that I came from, mm -hmm. uh, education becomes a very key component. And in the process of education, there's a lot of information that goes from everything from talking to young kids about the importance of education, which we know from being there, to corporations who talk about the importance of working together, uh, teamwork. And so the, so the combination of the two things that I find very important to me uh, becomes an avenue that I want to relate to other people, that they could understand where they really fit in the world. And so I, I enjoy doing that when I get an opportunity to do that. And I do some with my own corporation and some other places. I was just in the States doing a few. So it's uh, something I like doing. Were you able to motivate your kids with your skills? Uh, you probably have to ask them. I mean, I, I think I, I, I motivated them to the sense that they're all graduated right. from university. Uh, they've all, two are teachers, one's a director, uh, manager at a university. So uh, I think from a standpoint, not only me, but my wife, Sherry, have uh, put together a, a good relationship with our kids who are now giving back to the communities in the same way. Was religion important to you? And your family? Oh yeah, religion and, and, and my personal belief mm -hmm. in Christ is, is very critical, important to us. I mean, our family. I think that uh, fundamentals of, of guidance and direction, and when I sometimes speak to people, I talk about three things, in, inside your outside relationship of working together, and your upward relationship of working with others. I mean, working right. with, with, with God and authority and principles and truths and values. And all of those things are, are the fundamentals that allow us to be who we are, whatever right. whatever you find important to your upward bringing or whoever it would be. Uh, I found those things as a basis of principles and values that allow me to uh, help others, encourage others to be what they want to be. And what does Mr. Chuck Ely do now, presently, as an <laughs> presently, occupation? <laughs> I'm a, a regional director for Investors Group, and, and I hire and train people to do I call it medicine or work in the financial planning right. areas for different people, help other people. 
uh, accomplish their goals that they want to do for their retirement, their kids' mm -hmm. education, and, and that type of thing. So it, it's very exciting because every day is different and every day is new for me. So you really enjoy being with people? Oh, very much so. I think that uh, I, while I'm kind of introverted per se, I like being able to contribute to other people's lives that would allow them to make a difference because I think we all have something we bring to the plate right. that we can help and share with others that could help them be better. But sports is still a part of your life, like you're with the Mississauga Sports Council? Oh yeah, I'm with Arts. the Mississauga yeah. Sports Council and uh, I enjoy that fact that because I believe sport is a great basis for young kids to build discipline and character and value and teamwork and working with others. So the, the fundamental aspects of sports begins to set a lot of the disciplines and characters that made me who I am today. And how important has your wife been in your overall success? Because yeah. you've been married a long time, haven't you? <laughs> 35 years. <laughs> so uh, my wife's relationship with me has been just tremendous. She's been a tremendous support uh, with my kid, with the kids, and, and now our four grandsons uh, that we've got that, that allow us to um, just be able to build into their lives. And uh, she has done a, a great support for me and, and for our kids. Chuck, what do you do for fun? Uh, golf uh, right now. I've gone through all these different transitions in mm -hmm. sports. I, I started out after I retired playing a lot of basketball. Then I tried skiing and now I'm golfing. And and, and I just fundamentally enjoy sitting around and, and, and relaxing. I'm kind of a homebody for the most right. part when I am not working or when I'm not doing something in the community or, or out there. I'm kind of like chilling down pretty good and uh, relaxing. So uh, so right now, golf is my, my sport mind, <laughs> and then the rest of it is just kind of laying back and relaxing. So life's been good? Life has been excellent, and uh, I've enjoyed every moment of it. Any, any regrets for having to leave the States to come to Canada? Would you do it over again if you had to? Uh, I would do it over again. I wish the circumstances wouldn't have to have you do it. Mm -hmm. I may choose to do it versus having to do it. Uh, so there's no regrets because what happened in my life, you look back and your kids and the things that have right. happened, you can't have any regrets with that. Well, Chuck, it's been a pleasure having you here and we wish you continued success. Thank you. That wraps up another episode of One on One. I hope to see you next time. Venus Clothing was provided by Nygaard, located at 6075 Mavis Road in Mississauga. One on One was videotaped on location at Ethan Allen, located at 2161 Dundas Street West in Mississauga.